All right, we'll go ahead and get started today. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the March Talking Team webinar. My name is Luana Brashears, and I'll help facilitate today's webinar. The Talking Team webinar series is brought to you by the Federal Highway Administration Office of Operations, and it provides a forum where traffic incident management champions with any level of experience can exchange information about current practices, programs, and technologies. Just as a quick reminder, at NOCO, we offer a variety of resources to support the transportation systems management and operations community. So you can go to NOCO's website, which is transportationops.org, to browse through links for TISMO resources and news. Previous webinar recordings and case studies can also be accessed from there. So you haven't checked it out yet, that's a good chance to do so after, after this webinar. Now, just a, a few logistics for today's webinar. This webinar is recorded, is recorded and the recording will be available on NOCO's website as well. All the attendees are encouraged to stay engaged by using the Q&A feature for questions and the chat feature for comments. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you have two different boxes. Please add your questions to the Q&A area and then add your comments, overall introductions uh, to the chat pod. So we have the Q&A session at the end of all presentations, but if you have any questions, we encourage you to enter them in the Q&A area as they come to your mind at any time. Also, a few of you already started doing it, but please feel free to enter your name and agency in the chat to say hello to your peers. And then I'll just, uh, I'll just go over this. Uh, this is a standard USDOT FHWA disclaimer that reinforces that product names may be used during the webinar but the US government does not endorse any product. Additionally, uh, views and opinions expressed in this presentation are the presenters only, and they do not necessarily reflect those of Federal Highway Administration. Now I'll hand it over to Jim Ostrich. He is going to be today's webinar moderator. Jim. Thank you, Luana. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining, joining us again today. Uh, on behalf of the US DOT, Federal Highway Administration, Paul Joden, Joe Tebow, and myself, we're delighted uh, uh, to have you. And again, to reiterate, Luana and Anaf, who's with us as well from the National Operations Center of Excellence, a lot of resources there uh, regarding transportation systems management and operation, TISMO, if you're, if you're not aware. Uh, but we uh, certainly appreciate uh, uh, the NOCO, as we call it, hosting uh, our Talking Tim webinars. So you can see today's uh, agenda, uh, starting with the updates. Then we're going to go uh, into a, three great presentations, one on light emitting diodes, temporary, temporary traffic control devices for digital motorist alerts, and then movable barrier debris removal systems, and, Nash, and the national, uh, some uh, data that we're going to share with you on one of our projects uh, regarding the National Secondary Crash Research Project. And all those individuals that you see under those titles, I will introduce right before they present. So next slide. So here you see, uh, I hope most of you are aware that uh, uh, our office, the, the TIM program office of the Federal Highway Office of Operations, Paul, Joe, and I, we were fortunate to embark on a back-to-back -back Everyday Counts uh, project, Everyday Counts 7. We just completed Everyday Counts 6. And these are the six uh, technologies for saving lives. This the the six focus areas uh, that we're going to uh, embark uh, to assist states. Hopefully, all states uh, adopt the Everyday Count Seven Next Gen Tim uh, project. Again, the title uh, of Everyday Count Seven is Next Gen Tim Technology for Saving Lives. During today's presentation, the first two that you see highlighted here in yellow, advanced warning technologies and debris removal systems, you are going to hear uh, two of our presenters um, talk about those. So pretty exciting. And uh, you can see the other ones, the other four, emergency vehicle lighting, EVP, 
unmanned aerial systems, which we're keeping from EDC-6 because it's so popular. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, technologies that are under the national response, national roadway safety strategy under the USDOT, in particular, uh, uh, post-crash care and how we're going to support the emergency medical services community and that graphic that you see there to the right. So more to come on that. Next slide. Next month, April 26, right now, uh, we're working on a couple more presentations, but uh, if you're interested on uh, the responder to vehicle alerts, in particular the Haas alert, which we have uh, talked about over you know, the past two or three years here previously, this time, uh, the DC Fire Department that has been using the Haas Alert uh, is going to present. They've been using it for over two years. So uh, make sure you join us next month. And like I said, there's going to be a couple more uh, presentations that we will announce through the NOCO. So don't forget to register for that. Good news uh, still. Uh, Bad news that we have two fatalities uh, since January, but as we told you last webinar, I believe that we went the entire month of January and January and February with no uh, fatalities, line of duty deaths. Uh, but in early March, we we had our first fatality. You can see there a law enforcement officer on the third, and just this past week, uh, towing and recovery. Uh, professional was struck and killed. So we're we're up to two. One is too many, right? And uh, hopefully we're going to have another uh, year where where it's minimizing the the number of fatalities and hopefully injuries too. Of course, we don't know about injuries, but just st stay tuned uh, for that and keep doing everything you're doing to promote. Uh, marketing of line of duty desk, move over laws, et cetera. The training, we're just shy of 640,000 uh, responders trained since the summer of 2012. Yes, over 10 years ago. And uh, so this is the uh, tail of the tape, if you will. Great work, but much more to be done in our quest or our march, as our boss used to say, our march to well over 2 million to be trained. Next slide. This is the link, if you're not aware of it, uh, to uh, the respondersafety.com uh, incident reporting form to report a uh, struck by incident, line of duty death, injury, or even property damage. If you have a vehicle that's struck uh, with you know the operator not being injured or killed, thankfully, we still want to know about it. And uh, Federal Highway, in, in partnership with the Emergency Responder Safety Institute, as I said, respondersafety.com, they're all one and the same. Uh, this link resides there at the website, and you can go in and report the incident. So please take advantage of that um, if, if you learn of one of these type of incidents. Next slide. This is the national map showing the responders trained by state. The number on top is the in-person training versus the number below in parentheses, the number in that state that have taken the training online. Next slide. This is the breakdown that we always show of all the states and their progress. Uh, some states are still not progressing much, you know, in the single digits, others double digits all the way up to the top 10 states. Next slide, which you see right here. This is the, the numbers with, you know, in, since the last report, um, you can see these are the top, top 10. So kudos to these states. Next slide. Virtual Tim train the trainer sessions. I'm pretty sure we've shared this with the national Tim community. Uh, we're up to 145 right now and growing. 
uh, for today's webinar, but in case you're not aware, uh, we are sponsoring virtual train the trainers. And uh, we just uh, completed one on March 8th. As you can see, 50 participants, 21 states and Canada attended. And our next one is scheduled for Thursday, April 20th. Uh, the requirements you can see right there. We don't want vacationers, just being honest. We want trainers, seasoned trainers, hopefully that have already taken the Tim four-hour training and, and that are committed to the training, exactly what you see here, uh, committed to, to submitting training records because we know too many uh, have taken the, the train the trainer and never reported. Very sad, but true. Next slide. And that is it, my colleagues, Joe Tebow, Paul Joden, and myself. And again, I thank you for joining us today. And with that, we're going to introduce, or I'm going to introduce our first presenter. Pretty sure. Sam Taylor. Sam is the ITS support manager with FDOT, Florida DOT, District 7, which is in the Tampa Bay area. He manages multiple contracts related to TIM, Road Ranger Safety Patrol, and, an, and incentive tow pr programs. He brings to bear nearly a decade of experience as a former Road Ranger himself and a Regional Transportation Management Center Assistant Manager. So with that, I don't see his slides yet, Luana. Is that just me or is that? Thank you, Jim. I'm trying to trying to get them up. Here we go. Thank you. Yes, Thanks, sir. Sam. Yes, sir. Can you see my slide? Got it. Yes. We'll see it now. All right. Thank you for that, Jim. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Taylor. I work as a uh, for the Florida Department of Transportation, Tampa Bay area. Uh, I'll be covering the piling transponders and the uh, the LED road flares. Um, I think we can all agree on how important some of these safety initiatives are for men and women out there physically working in the field. Um, so we'll touch base on a couple of cool products. I will go over um, what our district actually covers for those that are not in the state of Florida, and we will we'll work on the rest. To, uh, to put our district into perspective, um, Florida is a decentralized network of about seven districts plus including the turnpike um, our district being district seven is in the tampa bay area we cover roughly five counties and manage two additional counties for our sister districts further south of us um, counties including hillsborough pasco pinellas um, hernando and citrus and some of those might sound kind of funny for you guys that are out of the state but they are very close inside with each other compared to how our orlando district where disney world is at over in district five um, we cover three of our major interstates here on uh, 275, I-4, and 175, 375 are um, kind of sisters to 275 little cutoff roads, as well as managing 75. Um, we have four major bridges over in the Tampa Bay area. We have our Courtney Campbell Causeway, our Howard Franklin, which is undergoing extensive uh, road work to uh, project some nice express lanes here in the near future. Um, Gandy Boulevard and the famous Sunshine Skyway Bridge. Looking at the pictures that you guys see on the screen, um, you have our breakdown of our districts in Florida, District 7 being the arrow. Um, our district is located on the western, the southwestern side of Florida. Below that, you'll see a, a map of our Road Ranger coverages. Um, it's kind of a little bit small, but you kind of see the areas that some of our Road Rangers do travel are pretty far. Um, we have a lot of rural routes up north on 75 where these road rangers um, have to make with what they have, um, with what they got to keep everybody safe out there. Um, map to the right is kind of what the program that they use in their computers called uh, the RIMS Road Ranger Information System. Um, this dictates where these road rangers are at via their GPS and their ABL data. Um, it shows them where they're at on the map as well as including an overlay of their physical zone. Um, so you can kind of see where they're traveling. So just to put that into perspective of how, 
how far out these guys are physically patrolling. So some of these safety initiatives could really help save a life when you have one guy out there on a 30, 40 mile stretch. Moving on to, to the historical timeline um, that we're gonna talk about today with our piling transponders. Um, for our district, uh, District 7, um, the pilot initiative design really began in March of last year. Uh, we initially started with two sets and two trucks, believe it or not, and um, a one uh, pilot transponder, which we'll go over further in the next couple slides. Um, some of these, these two pilots were placed in the overnight supervisor truck. The supervisor is a roam truck, um, so they go throughout our district and they don't have a set zone, but they can kind of touch base on policies and procedures and making sure other guys and gals of the team are holding up their end of the bargain and making sure they're keeping everybody safe out there as well as keeping themselves safe. Um, after that, in April, the following month, we created a training presentation with an in-depth video presentation um, that was shared with all of our supervisors. Um, the training was also shared with the traffic management center or the TOCs, as other states would call it. Um, with the operators so they can assist these supervisors and be informed of the new equipment that our fleet was using, as well as provide overnight technical support to a certain extent in case they had any questions. Um, there was a lot of positive feedback from our road rangers. Um, they're a big hit with our fleet in District 7. Um, we received overwhelming uh, positive responses and positive feedback from everybody out there, including motorists, citizens, myself included. Um, the, the durability of these, the battery, the hold, the convenience, ease of use, and uh, increased visibility, it all ties into a bigger picture of keeping everybody safe out there. And again, we're going to go over some of the great features here soon. Um, based on a lot of those good, the good feedbacks and the, the good return of the investments, we went ahead and uh, purchased a second secondary set for another one of our trucks in a longer set zone. Um, it was put into an evening supervisor truck, and it was this. This was kind of a test during our rush hour and sunset type lighting conditions. Um, with four sets of these ten pie lights, all of our road rangers uh, began trying different uses for them and seeing what they can do to accomplish uh, all in the name of safety. Figuring out where they can put the cones at, where they can put these pie lights at. Um, if they can, they can attach them to a truck. They can put them on the side of the truck. They can carry them with them. Um, so just coming up with different initiatives to try to keep them safe. Um, it is a new product for them, so they just want to make sure what, what is going to work best for them, you know. Um, throughout the continued communication with PyLite, uh, we started looking into purchasing the cloud subscription, aka the PyLink, which is what we're going to talk about next. Um, this, this subscription allows a, a somewhat a cloud connection with other mapping software, public mapping software like Waze, Google Maps, um, Apple Maps, and etc. Um, since the department did have uh, reservations on subscription costs of these phys of the physical devices, um, reoccurring subscriptions, we have an in-house consultant with our IT tech team um, that is currently collaborating to see if they can enhance our Road Rangers AVL software and data to include pop-up communications with Waze. Um, that is still in the works. Um, we're working pretty heavy on it, and if we can come up with a positive solution and another safety initiative, we can kind of branch out and release that to all the team stake, uh, key stakeholders. Um, as of today, um, before we get into the nitty gritty, um, all of our road rangers in our fleet are currently outfitted with one, if not two of these pie lights. Um, we have one additional truck with a pilot transponder that is still currently working. Um, and again, we'll go over the, those initiatives here in a second. Um, we are still going to continue to work with our IT staff in ways um, just to see if we can kind of integrate that uh, that language to where we can communicate our data to our public mapping software. So hopefully everybody that is driving out there that's using the ways, and even better with Google Maps can see that there is a road ranger or a first responder on the side of the road using this device. Moving on to the pilot, pilot, uh, pilot. There we go. Uh, we have some sequential road flares and the piling transponders. The first being the, the physical device, you know, the pie link, um, the pie light flare. Um, they come in sets of four, six, and 10. Uh, they synchronize with multiple sets. You have multiple units that are pulling up on scene. They kind of communicate together with them. They have only a six hour charge time, a bunch of unique different flash patterns, I believe four, five um, different sets. You have a slow sequential, fast sequential, and a solid, a solid light. Um, they're lightweight, they're versatile. You could throw them down a mountain, you could run them over with a semi, they're still gonna shine till the day they die. 
Um, they're visible from up to a thousand meters away. We have tested this um, 360 degrees horizontally and about 180 degrees vertically. And they automatically actually detect orientation. So if you smack them on the back of a truck, they're going to shine LEDs outwards toward oncoming motorists. You put them underneath the cone, it's going to shine that LED diode straight up to illuminate the cone. Um, a little bit about the Pi Link transponder. Um, this kind of allows the Pi Link, the Pi Light device to communicate with Waze. Um, this is a really special feature. It has two parts to it, um, as well as having two physical parts. Uh, when road rangers or safety service patrol are on scene, they can press a button on this transponder, sends that alert straight to Waze. They have to do no prior um, user input to that. Um, or when they take one of these physical Pi light flares off of the briefcase and attempt to deploy it, automatically sends that link out to Waze, showing that there is a first responder or whatever you guys categorize it as um, as it appears on Waze. I mean, it'll tell you, hey, this somebody's on scene. This is the location. It goes off of a cellular network and it is very accurate. Moving on to some of the pilot uses. Um, I have a couple of videos I want to share with you guys. Um, on the first video, um, just to kind of clarify, when you remove these from the case, it activates um, and it's very bright. Um, they also sync together. So when it goes off the first one deployed, you put a second one down, those two communicate and so on and so forth. Um, you can put 20 down. They're going to have a nice little runway for you guys uh, for the oncoming motorists further upstream of the incident. They kind of give that advance warning. 20-hour um, run time. I've tested this physically in my office, left them on overnight, shine, shine bright as day. Um, road rangers do use these in low light conditions and other areas where lighting is kind of scarce on those rural routes where you have a street light every mile. Um, all of our road rangers, again, are equipped with a 10 set briefcase of these, and I'm aware that other TOCs are still employing are employing these uh, same equipment across the states that also have nothing, uh, nothing negative to say about them. In the videos that we go over, you can kind of see on the, um, the first video, we have a road ranger that's walking through up to the incident scene. We have the illumination um, set pattern as a sequential uh, marker. Once this road ranger gets further up the up the way in about 10 seconds, you'll kind of see him point to one of these cones up here. Um, he's actually pointing to one that he did not put a pie light under, kind of showing the, the different um, visual aspects of it, showing this is a pie light lit cone. This is one without it. And just you can definitely see the difference of a cone that's lit up versus one that's not. Reflective or not, the ones that are lit up shine a lot brighter. On to the next video, uh, we kind of have a, a short little traffic scene inside of a uh, warehouse parking lot, just kind of set up a slower sequential pattern. We're going through some of these, uh, these patterns. Um, you have a quick pattern, a fast pattern, um, and the video did cut out, but we have a solid stationary pattern. So if you're sitting there for a long term, you can kind of just keep the cones illuminated physically without having a sequential pattern. Um, depending on the location, we have some videos um, that I did not show where motorists do not move right out of the way. And it, it all really depends on your advanced warning and how well that can be. And that does include secondary trucks. Um, and it includes the hill position and where, you're, where the incident scene is actually located at. To go over the pilot transponder really quick, um, it activates upon the flare deployment and it de deactivates upon you putting the flare back in and as the vehicle drives away. Um, they can be moved from truck to truck, vehicle to vehicle, only in a power source to work, and of course, a cellular subscription that you set up with the Pi Light manufacturer. Um, these text notifications, as you can see, circled, can be completely adjusted up to 80 characters. Um, and the programming, again, for the maps is done by Pi Light, so you do not have to worry about that. You just kind of have to let them in your life, make that subscription uh, notification, make that payment, um, and they will be able to set everything up for you. Uh, moving on to um, the transponder a little bit more, um, they do have recurring costs. Um, they are very flexible on the prices. I can't tell you what the prices are going to be for you. It's different for every district. It's different for every person that they physically talk to. Um, our district, as well as others, are, again, are still working on streamlining um, the process of using these this our AVL data in-house um, to post a public mapping service. And once we kind of fine tune that, we'll be able to reach out to other districts and other states to kind of show us how and, and, and the why and get you guys on board too. Wrapping things up, we always like to end with a positive PSA. Um, January was move over month, but I think everybody everybody should agree and will agree that every month should be move over month. Um, for all our first responders and safety service patrol workers, 
Um, they're providing those critical services out there on one of the most dangerous environments that's on the side or physically, unfortunately, in the roadway. Um, it's extremely important to slow down and move over for these emergency lights and these stopped safety workers. Um, at the end of the day, we all want to get home and we want everybody else to get home to their family and loved ones. So please remember to slow down and move over for emergency vehicle responders so you too can help save lives. I've also left my contact information below. So if anybody has any questions that we do not touch base in the Q&A, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Excellent presentation. Uh, as Sam just said, if anyone has any questions, uh, please put them in the chat pod, the Q&A, I should say, or the chat pod, but we have a Q&A, as uh, Luana said, down below on the bar, right next to the chat pod. So, uh, can't agree with you more, uh, Sam, on the your comment about every day should be move over day. Thank you, uh, and uh, no, indeed. And the presentation on this device um, uh, is is excellent. I, I hope it continues to grow. It's obviously a, a useful device, very useful device. So absolutely. Yep. So with that. Uh, we're going to move on to our next presenter, Eric Hemphill, our friend from uh, North Texas Tollway Authority. Eric is the Director of Traffic and Incident Management, and uh, he oversees traffic engineering, safety, and incident response. So with that, Eric. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for allowing me to be part of this. Uh, thank you for your patience that I jump a few topics around. So uh, they asked me to cover a couple of things. So I'm gonna jump around a little bit, but hopefully uh, you learned something new today. So first and foremost, I am the Director of Traffic Incident Management for the North Texas Tollway Authority. Uh, I do have to say that we are a state agency created by our state legislature here in the state of Texas, but we only have a six district or six county jurisdiction. So we're a little bit strange on that side of things as a state agency. And here's a little example of our outline of our system. Uh, Fort Worth is on the left-hand side, Dallas is on the right. Uh, to give you an idea, that's about 150 centerline miles with an average of about 11 million vehicle miles traveled per day on our system. Uh, and we're responsible for keeping everybody safe and if they're not getting it out of there quickly. Uh, the Traffic Incident Management Department is uh, has basically two of the three stools of the engineering education and uh, outreach. Uh, we have the Safety Operations Center, our 24-7, 365 Traffic Management Center, which is slightly different from most because we also are a secondary 911 center and we dispatch state troopers through our licensed telecommunicators that are also NTTA employees. Our traffic engineering side helps us with all the statistics to make sure we don't have crashes, uh, if we do have incidents, our roadside safety services, which are safety service patrol, is a 24-7, 365 uh, patrol on our entire roadway system. Uh, the state troopers, they are assigned to the North Texas Tollway Authority. They are tollway troopers. Uh, even though they are state troopers, they're assigned to us as part of their district. And then we have the safety emergency management folks that uh, help us keep everything straight in the end and worry about uh, if something does go wrong, how do we clean it up? So today, I always start out with why we're here. I think everybody on this call understands this and unfortunately probably have seen some pictures like this. Uh, our goal is to stay safe every day, every call. and every shift briefing, we tell everybody, you're going to go home today with the same stuff you walked in here. You're not gonna have any bumps, bruises, sprains, uh, and you're definitely not gonna take a trip to the hospital. That is our goal from day one, is our employee safety and everything about it. Uh, in this picture, you can see how much, how significant the impact of the damage was. If you look closely, you'll see that cone bases were separated from cones. Uh, those are not two-part cones. Uh, you can see all the debris field and how far a Chevy 1500 was pushed uh, by a distracted vehicle. Uh, if you look really, really closely, you can see the unfortunate orange paint around some of the car. Uh, thankfully, uh, our operator was uh, using his proper techniques for blocking and uh, debris pickup on this. And he ended up with serious injury, what appeared to be serious injuries at the time, uh, but he ended up being released from the hospital just a couple hours after this. So this is what we look out, this is what we're looking for, and this is what we're trying to prevent. 
everybody going home every day. So in order to do that, as part of our continuing uh, improvement culture that we have, as we have incidents and debrief things, we challenge our team. Every day, everybody from down to the operators up to the upper management is challenged every single day to bring a new or exciting method on how we do things. And part of what we did with that is we reaching out and always continually looking for different ideas. One of these things that came forward was what you see in front of you. Uh, it is lane, labeled a lane blade, but it is our debris removal device. On the right hand side, you can see it deployed. It looks much like a snow plow, uh, but uh, it will not push snow or sand or anything like that, but man, will it remove debris. On the left, you can see that it is in the upright position and it looks like a massive push bumper. Uh, we can still do what one of our main tactics is to do and that's clear the roadway by pushing crashed, stalled, disabled vehicles out of the roadway, uh, box trucks, et cetera. This blame blade up in its configuration like that does not stop us from doing that. But when it is down, it is a tremendous help to keeping boots off the ground in any vehicle. So when you talk about debris, we're not just talking about tires. Uh, let's say you had some cans of biscuit dough that a trash can was moving from one or trash uh, truck was moving from one to the other and dumped his load on your roadway. So instead of having 20 people out there sweeping these biscuit dough cans up, you can see how the lane blade was able to put it in a pile. Yeah, we still had to put it in trash cans to get it out of trash bags to get it out of there. But instead of 20 people sweeping, this goes back and forth a few times, gets it into a pile. And meanwhile, the maintenance team is on their way with a sweeper. But by the time they got out there, we had all of this cleaned up and the road back open. So it does work on strange things but it works on things that you probably have seen every single day in your career on the call. What you see here is what's left of an extension ladder circled in red. I want you to pay attention to that area and you can see the lane blade coming around the corner. Normally these two vehicles would have to park, block the roadway. Some of our employees would have to get out of the truck in order to push this debris to the median, to the shoulder, throw it in the back of the truck and remove it. But you can see approaching at about 20 miles an hour, the lane blade is deployed. Uh, the secondary truck is still blocking back there just in case uh, something went wrong. Normally we don't have that truck, but you can see it's pushing along the debris on the roadway. Uh, no issues, no problem. It's still scooping up the stuff as we go and it safely pushes it off to the shoulder where either we can leave it on the shoulder and call our maintenance team to say, hey, come pick this up. You guys have the big attenuator trucks and you're designed for that. Or we can pull over to the shoulder, throw it in the back of our truck and get on our way. But either way, you noticed how quickly that took uh, place uh, in that. That was about 40 seconds worth of video to get that entire ladder and all the pieces off to the side. So you're thinking to yourself, something like this must be difficult to control. But no, it's not. You can see the joystick. Uh, most of our younger employees have a lot of experience uh, with controllers for video games, et cetera. This is no different. It's got an up, down, wings forward, wings back, and a power switch all the way on. Uh, double tapping, you can uh, get it down quicker. So it's simply a portion of our console. You can see it on the left-hand side. It's just a utility on our console. Uh, and then in the middle, you can see the actual control is not complicated at all. On the right, this does have two cameras that are viewed in the cab. So when you are approaching that debris, you can see that it is lined up. Uh, you cannot deploy this if you're going over 20 miles an hour, but once it is deployed, it does have the safety feature that you can speed up as fast as you need to in order to try to get out of the road. So it's a nice little safety addition to that portion of it. So what happens, uh, what I can tell you is, as we're about to get into the next topic, do you have a plan? And I showed you that vehicle of being struck along the roadway while they were picking up debris. Our plans are that we have designated areas in our CAD dispatch. So when our CAD operators get a phone call in that area and dispatch for any type of incident, being crashed, debris, stalled vehicle, whatever it might be, automatically it tells our CAD operators that more than one truck has to go in this area. It took some time to look at our geometry, look at our horizontal, vertical curves, some of our on-ramp configurations. We have roadways that just opened a few years ago to roadways that were built back in 1967. So all of the geometry is different in those. 
And what I can tell you is that this costs nothing but time, but it is a tremendous help to everybody. You can see in this picture up in the front where the uh, incident occurred, but you can see back just a little bit farther, there's another truck. If you notice that cone line continues because even behind that is another truck because this is a massive horizontal curve that what we don't want is somebody coming around that corner to quick clip and nailing one of our folks. Now I hear this from time to time when I mention this, that yeah, we only have one truck on the route at one time. We only have two, it would take forever to get there. We also partner with our local police departments and the state troopers we dispatch directly to make sure they understand the importance of this. Because rest assured, if one of our trucks is struck, the local PDs or the state troopers are gonna have to go out there and respond anyway. So if we can help get their assistance to help move over, slow down before our incident and give people those times to look, because basically we stage where you can see us better. You cannot see people as you go around this curve until you're right up on them and it's too late. Either you strike us or strike somebody else. So I wanna leave you with that. No matter what we talk about today, this is a free way to try to keep your folks safer. Have a plan. So when you are talking about trying to alert the public, the best way to tell them you're on there is message boards. Almost everybody that I see around has message boards. What separates us from others is ours rotates. So you can see on the left-hand side, that truck is almost, uh, that arrow board is almost uh, uh, parallel with the truck. You can see the arrow just fine. It's slight angle on the right-hand side. You can still read that message without any issue. If you ever parked a truck sideways or parked it at an angle for proper blocking techniques without a rotating message board, you're basically cutting off the message you're sending to the folks and relying purely on the visibility of your trucks. So what we have are rotating message boards. And when I say rotating message boards, they rotate 360 degrees around. So if we need to park sideways in the roadway like this, we can turn the, turn the board sideways. Not only our lights are flashing, but they can see that message without any um, obscurity from being turned or curved or whatever it might be. This is also simply operated from a uh, device inside the truck, turning to the angle you want it to go, hitting go and it goes around uh, and then turn it back to deploy. If you have message boards like this, the rotating portion is not much more to add to your system, continue considering the cost benefit of what we have. Uh, we can pull sideways across the road and, and block the entire road with a message facing everybody until we can get additional resources there. And here's what it looks like on an incident scene. You can see that this car, this truck is parked at an angle to block the shoulder and the right lane. Uh, the message board looks like it's head on and it's because it is. It's, uh, it, is spring, it is showing straight at you. Higher visibility, better reaction time from the folks, safer employees all the way together. So you see us parked here. And one of the topics they asked me to cover is mobile barrier or mobile barriers. And what I said before is, or what I've told them was we have mobile barriers. Everybody has mobile barriers. Here's four trucks. They're mobile, they're barriers. You tie them end to end, uh, nobody's getting through. And that's not quite what they meant when they said, hey, can you cover the mobile barrier side of your operation? I think we've all seen this. We've all been there. Roads gotta be closed. We gotta do something. I've got trucks on the way. Well, we have a little something else in our arsenal. We have movable barrier. Now you say, well, that is that is movable barrier, but that does not seem to be very efficient. You're right. We'd love to be able to bring out concrete barriers, seal off the site, protect all of our traffic incident managers and make sure nobody gets through. This is not practical for quick clearance, quick traffic incident management. So we have the mobile barrier trailer. As you can see here, it isn't a configuration being pulled by one of our tractors. It does have the screening fence attached. We don't drive it with the screening fence attached. Uh, but this is what we can put up at fatality scenes, uh, road closures, keep the looky-loos off of our site and make sure we're protecting the first responders. So here's a couple of configurations. Here's our maintenance team repairing a guardrail, uh, taking up less traffic, uh, creating a spot where they're behind a, bowl, behind a barrier uh, without any problems. People say, how long does it take to deploy that thing? It looks massive, it looks big. Um, it's not. So. Here is a quick video of it coming in, deploying, and the timer in the bottom right is in minutes and seconds and tenths of seconds or hundreds. Uh, you can see that within about five to six minutes from us pulling up on scene, we can deploy everything, deploy the uh, rumble strips we have, and then you can see us coming back to pick them up. 
the attenuator goes down in the back, message board goes up. By the time they're pretty much done with that, uh, if you notice the storage area, we're putting the rumble strips back in the mobile barrier trailer and getting on our way in less than five minutes. So it's quick to deploy, quick to pick up. So it goes into quick clearance. People are concerned sometimes about the crash worthiness of it. Well, I can show you here is the MASH crash, which is the latest MASH crash, MASH, MASH is the latest crash test criteria uh, from Federal Highway Administration. So uh, you can see here a Dodge pickup truck coming, the yellow one's the ones you're looking for, uh, sitting, hitting it at a roughly 62 and a half miles an hour and it barely moves. So it creates that cocoon of a space for you. But one of the things we've added to the mobile barrier trailer, and I would say you could add this to any attenuator truck you have for a very low cost, very effective thing. It's a simple radar detector and a simple feedback sign. On the back of the mobile barrier trailer, here is an incident scene. We're working an incident on there. When we first deployed it and sent it out, 63 miles per hour was the speeds we were getting from people going by. This is a 70 mile an hour roadway, so we were slightly impressed that they were somewhat sticking to the move over or slow down law uh, when we were doing our incident. However, shortly after deploying and be able to display those speeds to folks, uh, we got it down to 55 miles an hour where it was roughly staying at. Again, that's on the back of the mobile barrier trailer, but that radar and speed feedback sign we have on some of our attenuator trucks too, just doing regular closures. And it makes a world of difference for people to see how fast they're going uh, in a big sign that's kind of pointing out the fact that they're not doing what they're supposed to and we get compliance that way. So providing positive protection, I showed you those four trucks earlier sitting there blocking the roadway. Look at what one mobile barrier trailer is doing. It is providing what four to five trucks would take to do. Uh, we're working an incident scene on the other side of this. Uh, the side that we're seeing is from the incident scene. The drivers see that flat side that's coming at them. Uh, so the road is completely closed and you're not getting through there no matter how much you try. Now you look at this and you say, that looks like a weird way to set up for uh, a closure. It looks like you're pointing right at all the traffic. However, this is on the other side of the incident. Uh, many of you might be familiar with first responders getting struck by wrong way drivers. That happens on our road too. We are simply what everybody in the world has to deal with is wrong way drivers late at night. So on incidents, we will actually park this on the other side as well. So cocooning ourselves in, uh, you can see that it looks like the lights are pointing at traffic, but they're not. If the lights are pointing at you, you're going the wrong way. On the other side of this, is you can see in the background where the incident is working. So if you're not protecting one way or the other from the wrong way drivers on some of these highways at night, please do something to keep steel between you and them because they don't stop. And proof of that is in this picture here. It's hard to see uh, after this picture and everybody was shook up so we couldn't take a picture while it was happening. But that little line you see on the ground is from the rim of a wrong way driver that was driving on his rims down the roadway towards our work zone. Uh, the guys had the back protected, no problem. We put this mobile barrier trailer on the other side of it. Uh, he was not going to stop. He ended up slightly uh, hitting the mobile barrier trailers. He was trying to go around it, but running on rims, going the wrong way, headed towards our work zone. So uh, it does happen in, uh, it did protect about six people that night that probably would have been struck by that wrong way driver. So uh, the cost benefit analysis for us is tremendously worth it. So with that, uh, here's my name and contact number uh, and email address. If you have any questions, want to discuss further uh, any of our other initiatives or anything we have, please don't uh, hesitate to reach out to me. We also love to learn what other folks are doing. So thank you, Jim. Thank you, Eric. Outstanding uh, presentation. Uh, one question, and by the way, Sam, I'm going to come back at the end. Uh, we have three questions in the Q&A uh, for you, and I apologize. I didn't catch them in time. But for you, Eric, is the uh, does the Lane Blake qualify for stick funding? Do you I know? don't. I do not know. Um, as a tollway agency, although we're a state agency, we are funded only by the tolls we have. And so we um, try to operate, maintain without federal funding. Uh, so we do okay. not necessarily, I do not know the answer to that question. So I apologize for that. Okay. And if anyone uh, is curious, I, I apologize. I said stick funding, which stands for 
State Transportation Innovation Council funding uh, that through the DOT uh, uh, stakeholders are eligible for up to $100,000 uh, per year. Uh, the, we obviously, the, the uh, acronym STIC, S-T-I-C, again, State Transportation Innovation Council. Um, so uh, let's see. Eric, thanks again. Let me, I see a fifth question here. Let me make sure while I have you, Eric. Can you share the contact info in the chat? I certainly will. Okay, very good. Thank you, Miranda, for that question. And the others too, by the way, uh, Luana, I see anonymous attendee. Uh, sure wish we had the names of these individuals that are asking these questions, but we'll work on that later. <laughs> anyway, uh, gonna move on to our next presenters. Uh, let's see, what time-wise, we have about just under 45 minutes. Uh, so our next presenters, starting with Dr. Pecha, Kelly Pecha, who is a, a friend of the Federal Highways Office of Operations, Tim Program Office. Kelly's a senior director for the transportation uh, section at AEM. She was the project manager for the secondary crash research that we're going to talk about today and has led multiple FHWA and NCHRP uh, and state projects on responders struck by crashes, Tim performance measures, and applying big data approaches to improve traffic incident management. Kelly's joined uh, by Dr. Grady Carrick. Grady is uh, also a dear friend of the program and uh, retired Florida Highway Patrol Chief and works uh, now works with state and federal agencies as well to advance a safe and efficient transportation system. He is the chair of the Transporta Transportation Research Board, Board, TRB, Traffic Law Enforcement Committee, has numerous presentation publications to his credit and is the principal with Enforcement Engineering, Inc. So with that, Kelly, Grady. Thanks, Jim. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So Grady and I are going to tag team this presentation and tell you a little bit about the secondary crash research that we just wrapped up for Federal Highway. Um, next slide, please. So um, we're just there's a lot of information. Um, this report, the final report, is uh, in publication review and and hopefully will be out uh, soon. But uh, so we're just going to give you an overview of, of the research, um, what our, our objectives were, define a secondary crash, talk about the data that we collected, how we analyzed the data, and then um, took a little bit deeper dive into some case studies of particular secondary crashes. Excellent. So we, there's a lot of have been in the past a lot of anecdotal information about um, secondary crashes, like how what's the percentage of secondary crash, um, how serious are secondary crashes, what circumstances do they occur in. But uh, until a, a few years ago, there there wasn't really a lot of data to back up um, some of those some of those uh, statements or assumptions. And so the the objective of this research was to take uh, more recent data that was available on secondary crashes and try to just back up some of those those statements and assumptions with with data um, and then um, also take a, a deeper dive into one or more states and based on the information or the findings from the data assessment uh, try to look at uh, particular crashes that occurred and and how um, they could be potentially mitigated through countermeasures. So second, a definition of secondary crash was set um, a number of years ago with the Focus States Initiative. Uh, so, so a secondary crash is defined as a crash that occurs within an incident scene or within the queue or backup, including the opposite direction resulting from an, an original incident. Um, so this could be an original crash, uh, a primary crash, 
which is the way um, I think a lot of states and even federal highway as a simpl simplification has suggested a crash to crash relationship, but recognizing that um, secondary crashes can also occur from non crash incidents such as uh, debris in the road. Next slide. So. As I mentioned more recently, there have been uh, more, more data available on secondary crashes. Uh, back in 2017, uh, the MUC uh, fifth edition added a secondary crash data element. It's shown there on the right. Um, and uh, many states have, over the last six years, have started to add uh, that a data element or a similar data element to their state traffic crash reports and have begun to attempt to uh, collect this data so that we have more information on crashes that are that are secondary in nature. So our our approach was to gather data from a number of these states that have added this this uh, data element and then try to uniformize that data across the states recognizing that um, states have different crash reports they define things sometimes differently. And there was a big effort to not only collect the data from the states, but then um, standardize that across the states so that we could do some analysis. Um, we also did a spatial temporal analysis to try to match the secondary crashes that were flagged in the data that we got from the states to a primary crash candidate so that we um, we were fairly confident that the, cr the crashes that we were analyzing were secondary. And um, then we did some analysis and um, developed some case studies. So that we, we received data from 10 states. Um, the data that we received from the states, there was nearly 52,000 crashes marked as secondary. Um, this was over a couple million crashes. And the, those 52, about 52,000 crashes are shown in the states on, on this map. Uh, so you, you get an idea of the distribution of the states and um, kind of the distribution of the secondary crashes. You can really see them along uh, some of the major roadways, especially in the more rural states. And then um, uh, they, you know, in the states in, in the east, uh, there's more clumps, but a, a good deal of secondary crashes. And one more clip, Luana. Um, these were uh, the locations that we were able to find in the those crashes where we were able to find a, a crash that we felt was a, prim a primary crash candidate. So we actually have that crash to crash relationship for about 15,000, a little more than 15,000 of the crashes. And, and those were the crashes that we focused on for the analysis. So this is just a, a quick breakdown. Um, one of the things we've, I think many of you have probably heard in the past is that up to as many as 20% of crashes could be secondary in nature. We didn't really see that in the data that we collected. This is a breakdown of the number of crashes um, that were marked as secondary in each state and the, um, that number divided into the total number of crashes for the same time period that we received from the state. Um, ranged from about 0.25%, 0.28% up to uh, a little over 3%. So on average, just about 1% of the crashes. Um, that number goes down when we try to make that um, crash to crash relationship to, to fewer. So um, just kind of put that uh, percentage of secondary crashes into perspective a little bit, um, significantly less than some of the numbers that um, have been thrown around in the past based on the data. Next slide. So we focused on those uh, about 15,000 crashes that we have that crash to crash relationship. And, and we did some descriptive statistics. We looked at the secondary crashes by a lot of different factors. So next slide. Um, this slide shows by time of day, um, this follows a typical um, volume pattern. And um, so I don't know that there's anything really um, here that jumps out other than the more the more vehicles that are on the road, the more secondary crashes um, following that sort of morning and, and evening peak and then lowers overnight. Next slide. Looking at um, secondary crashes by day of week, we do see that Fridays kind of pop up um, and that Saturdays and Sundays are fewer, which is, which is kind of interesting. Whereas like Monday through Thursday, it's about the same number of crashes, um, but there does appear to be a little bit higher um, number of secondary crashes on Fridays. 
looking at roadway type, uh, this isn't, I don't think, too uh, surprising. Uh, the large, a large number occur on interstate highways or other uh, freeways, but we do see that we're capturing um, it through these crash reports, capturing secondary crashes that occur on arterials, principal and minor arterials, a few on collectors, and, and even a, 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 a few on minor collectors. Looking at severity, um, while you have all kinds of, of injury severities, the most of them, the large majority, have no apparent injury, um, but a few fatals and suspected serious injuries um, as well. So this is another one where I think sometimes it's it's thought that maybe secondary crashes are more severe in nature, and while we do see those, um, most of them really in, don't involve an injury. Looking at weather conditions, and if, if you recall the, the map, we do have states um, with, with um, winter weather conditions included in the data. And we hear a lot about um, multiple secondary collisions occurring in, in winter weather conditions where the visibility is reduced and the pavement is slick. And we do see uh, 265 occurring in snow conditions, but um, most of these are occurring um, during clear conditions during the day or clear conditions at night or partly cloudy. So um, most are occurring in non-inclement weather conditions. Same with lighting. Uh, most of them are large majority are, are daylight or dark lighted. So because we had, because we connected, uh, we matched a, a secondary crash that we had in the, in the data, most states, the only state that we had that had a connection between a primary and a secondary crash was Wisconsin. So in most cases, we only knew that this was flagged as a secondary, but we didn't know what the, the, the primary crash or primary incident was. So that's why we did that matching to try to find the primary. And what this does is this chart looks at the distribution of the time between the primary and the secondary. And it shows that a large majority actually have the exact same time, the, the primary crash and the secondary crash that we've matched have the exact same time. And um, which says that, you know, a lot of these crashes are ha happening bang, bang. So probably before responders are even able to get on the scene, a lot of these secondary crashes are occurring. And then there's a long tail out to the right up to a couple of hours after uh, the primary. And you see that the spike at 60 and you see kind of the up, down, up, down, that's really rounding to five, 10, 15, 20, et cetera, mi minutes with those that spike at 60 and another spike at 120. So that just captures some of the human nature of the data that's being collected, but um, shows that that these, these secondary crashes, a lot of them occur just back to back. And, the, and this slide is the same idea, but the distance between the primary and the secondary, same thing. Um, a lot of the secondary crashes had the exact same GPS coordinate, coordinates as the primary crash that we matched it to. And um, then you have the long tail up to about a little over a kilometer back, but um, most are happening very, very, quickly and within very close proximity to the primary the primary crash. So with that very quick overview of the data, I'm going to turn it over to Grady to talk a little bit about um, the secondary crash typologies and the case studies that we developed. Awesome. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so this is really an, a very interesting study, having looked at about 52,000 secondary crashes and more than 15,000 primary events that were linked with those secondary crashes. So the descriptive statistics that Kelly uh, was able to show you um, really kind of paint a picture of what, what's going on with those secondary crashes. But we wanted to do a little deeper dive. So what we did is we took several hundred of those uh, crashes, and we we looked at and analyzed the report narratives and diagrams 
uh, from the actual police crash reports. And we created some coding to go along with those um, reviews of those narratives and diagrams. So the first thing that we came up with um, is this this grouping uh, of what's going on and what how are these you know secondary crashes happening, and uh, you know uh, the first one there uh, the type one uh, example is the one that readily comes to mind for everybody and that's the rear end crash that happens you know upstream of our incident or maybe right next to our incident um, the the crash with a vehicle involved in a prior crash that is one that again was very common in the data it's that bang bang type of situation situation that Kelly described where there's a there's a crash and then within just moments or seconds there's another vehicle running into that crash uh, at the uh, original scene. Vehicles versus fixed object was uh, again something we saw a lot in the data. People are approaching these scenes. Uh, there's a sudden slowdown. Uh, they're trying to avoid uh, things and, and uh, they lose control and they maybe they strike a guardrail or a barrier or other uh, a pole or other things. Debris from prior crashes uh, is not real common, but it does happen. It was significant enough to make it a typology. Lane changing. People are coming up on our scenes and they're having to shift lanes to, again, navigate around our incident. And in the process of doing that, a lot of times they'll kind of... Uh, kind of get into each other in the side swiping, same direction side swiping type of arrangement. And then the, the last one, type six, is the one that we all worry the most about, and that is the responder struck by incidents uh, where a vehicle is approaching our scene and they run into one of the responder vehicles, or even worse, as Jim mentioned earlier in our struck by statistics, they hit one of our pedestrian responders. So those are our types, uh, six typologies. And what we want to do is just kind of do a deep dive and look at some examples where some of those uh, types kind of uh, present themselves. Next slide. So the first uh, case study that we want to share with you today is uh, out of the Central Florida area in Orlando. And what happened on this particular day uh, was a, a wet roadway and it was uh, light traffic in the early morning hours and um, uh, a series of crashes actually happened. And this is what, oftentimes what happens with these secondary crashes. And not only is there one, but there are you know, sometimes multiple secondary crashes. So um, here's a timeline and kind of a description of what went on here. And over on the right-hand side of your screen, you see an, uh, an aerial view of the roadway uh, during this time and uh, kind of that, that that spatial distribution of where these crashes happen. So the first one happens, uh, you know, around 7:43 in the morning. Uh, 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 vehicle uh, driving down the road loses control, high, hits the wall, winds up partly on the outside lane and the shoulder, and another vehicle comes along and loses control as well and hits that first vehicle. Uh, about then, we get some responders on the scene. They start setting up some traffic control. Uh, the crash report times are the ones listed here, but we kind of figure there's probably a little bit of difference in the actual time. But uh, around 7.50, uh, we've got some traffic control set up. We've got some air boards out there. And uh, that's when, uh, again, uh, vehicles are changing lanes and they get tied up and then they wind up kind of sliding all over the road and hitting uh, one of our responder vehicles. Uh, while this is happening, uh, a little further upstream at uh, collision number three at 8.20 a.m. So we've been on the scene now for about 30 minutes. Uh, and this is where, uh, again, another vehicle loses control and uh, a single vehicle crash occurs. Uh, more Tra traffic congestion uh, happens after that, and in that queue, there's a rear end collision that happens. Next slide. So here's kind of a uh, sequence of the events. So we'll click through these uh, just to kind of show you what's going on from those crash reports. So the first, here's the roadway segment that we're talking about. Um, and so that first crash occurs and uh, it's this Lexus uh, that's driving along. We'll go ahead and click up to that, and they spin out and hit the uh, the guardrail on the right side. And they actually wind up facing the wrong direction uh, over on the right side of the road. Um, next slide. So here is that uh, first secondary crash. Uh, driver's driving along in the outside lane, sees something up ahead, uh, decides to change lane, gets a little squirrely because, again, this roadway's wet. 
Um, and uh, there's a slight curvature to the roadway, maybe misjudged their speed, got, uh, got a little out of control and wound up uh, going over and striking the first vehicle and striking the guardrail. Next slide. So here's where we get on the scene. We put up our, our cones and our arrow boards. Uh, that vehicle three that's in the lower center part of your uh, diagram there is the, the road ranger that's on scene with an arrow board. And uh, you see uh, vehicle one and vehicle two coming around the corner in lane two and lane one. And, uh, and again, there's a lane change that is attempted vehicle loses control, hits the other vehicle. They both wind up going into the uh, traffic control area, temporary traffic control area, striking the wall and striking our road ranger. Next slide. There's our next single vehicle a little further upstream. The road still curves further upstream, but uh, you can see here it's all, it's, there's no guardrail. It's concrete wall back there. Uh, hits, the, uh, hits the inside and then goes out to the outside and comes to final rest. That creates a lot of onlooker delays, and that's when traffic starts backing up in the last uh, crash that we see happens. And let's pop that diagram up there. And that's your typical rear end collision uh, in the upstream area. So let's click on uh, forward now. We'll see, uh, we're lucky enough to have an actual video. So there's our Road Ranger set up, law enforcement's there, and these are the vehicles that intrude into the scene. And uh, Again, just, you know, careless folks, light traffic, you know, uh, uh, on a morning uh, uh, with a little bit of rain. And you can see they just get uh, get out of control and, and strike our uh, responder vehicle. All right, let's go ahead. Next uh, slide. So to wrap up this one, we had four secondary crashes. Um, now, we, we learned from our data analysis that a lot of times these secondary crashes, as a matter of fact, the majority of the time these secondary crashes do not involve injuries. But in today's example, with these four secondary crashes, we actually had three of the four uh, in, involved uh, more serious injuries, and all three of those uh, required transportation uh, with incapacitating injuries. Um, uh, or nine incapacitating injuries in the, the fourth one there. So uh, not too serious of injuries, but enough for them to take a ride to the hospital. Next slide. So the next case study uh, is uh, the so southern part of Florida, down around the Stewart, Fort Pierce area. Um, and this is about 4.50 in the morning. Uh, this is on Interstate 95. There's a, 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 there's a large truck uh, driving along, and he's not paying attention and the truck uh, pickup truck in front of him is driving a little bit slower. Uh, doesn't really perceive that there's a danger until the last moment. And he, he rear ends that pickup truck, uh, goes off to the side of the roadway, off to the right, hits a light pole, goes down the embankment and comes back up on the other side and hits a fence. So a lot going on here with this crash. Uh, fortunately, there were not a lot of serious injuries here in this first event, but it did cause that light pole to fall down on the outside lane of the roadway. And again, that bang bang type situation, a vehicle comes along in that right hand lane and hits the light pole that's down in the road because it had literally just fallen in front of them. We get, a, we get our responders on the scene and um, um, uh, they set up a pr pretty nice traffic control. Let's go ahead and click forward. And you can see the traffic control that's set up. So we've got a couple law enforcement officers on the scene. We actually had three arrow boards out here. We've got the right lane of three lanes blocked. They did a nice job of setting up a good protected uh, area with a lane plus one to give all these responders a little extra room to work. We've got that pole that they're dealing with. We've got this vehicle that's off the, uh, the roadway that's going to have to be recovered with a heavy wrecker. But what I want you to focus on is in the inside lane, lane one, you see that white uh, van with the ladders on the top. That's the guy that's going to come along and cause things to really get ugly here. Uh, the vehicle in front of him is an Audi, a uh, Audi sedan, and that Audi is going to going to check up a little bit, going to slow a little bit, and that van is not going to slow. Uh, we're at uh, you know we're we're, we're clipping along at uh, at uh, pretty close to highway speeds here, it's free, free flow conditions. And uh, he's going to get into the back of that Audi and send it right into our scene. So let's click forward and see the video from that. 
So what see here is he's hit the back of that Audi and that Audi has come into our scene. Trooper pushes the person out of the way. The, again, they're over on the shoulder. Um, and for the sake of, uh, you know, just for the sake of, uh, uh, you know, uh, not, not wanting to expose anybody to anything uh, too terrible. I, I paused the video here, but uh, he does get, the trooper does get struck, requires transportation. Troopers out of uh, commission for several months, but was able to come back to work. So again, uh, let's click forward and take a look at uh, what happened here. So there's your primary crash, no injury, secondary crash car hits the light pole and again no injury but that next one that came along after we're there and we've got all this elaborated traffic control set up um, is when uh, when uh, again a, a vehicle hits another vehicle and sends it into our scene and into our responders that uh, were there next slide so some of the findings I think to summarize the research that uh, Kelly and I worked on um, uh, you, you know, we found that mostly uh, interstates, principal arterials, urban areas, uh, and clear weather were present. Um, a lot of times, th these don't involve injuries, um, but when they do, they can be uh, they can be pretty serious and fatal. Um, Two thirds of them are front to rear. It's that classic rear end crash that we all know about for secondaries. 10% though are the same direction side swipe and 10% are single vehicles. Um, close proximity to our initial crash uh, happening at the same location and happening in close proximity in time. A lot of times these secondaries are happening before we're even there and before we're on the scene. But that doesn't mean that Tim is not a good strategy to prevent secondary crashes because we know that once we get there, if we can do the things that we do, we can make it safer, but we can't always make it bulletproof. So we've got to be our, uh, 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 constantly on uh, alert and on on uh, our situational awareness and making sure our head is on a swivel. Next slide. So as far as data goes, as far as secondary crash data goes, we really would like to see better linkages between that primary and secondary event if we can ha actually have the report numbers in the opposing primary and secondary reports that would be very uh, beneficial for researchers like us to go back and pull the two and marry them up. Um, we think that while we did this analysis combining 10 states and 52,000 crashes, we think you can do a lot with your data at a state level if you're collecting this particular type of data. So we want to encourage regional and state analysis. Um, when we do try to combine it across states, uh, it gets a little bit tricky. A lot of these data elements and attributes don't always lined up. Even though there's national guidance, there is no national mandate that data look the same uh, and be structured the same. And then quality and completeness of the data is always something that we really would like to see improved. So we really want to challenge and encourage our law enforcement to uh, to, to do a, a better job of uh, documenting the facts of these secondary crashes and uh, hopefully putting details in those narratives and diagrams that can help us uh, down the road. Next slide. So that kind of summarizes our presentation and we thank you for giving us a chance to present. Grady, thank you. And Kelly as well. Questions answer uh, answers now, folks. We have about 15 minutes. Grady, Kelly, I don't know if you've seen the Q&A box. Hey, Jim. Um, yeah, Paul. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll chime in here for a second. Okay, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I just want to emphasize, because this, you know, this is a study that I asked the contractors to do here that this was not a nationwide study. Um, so, um, uh, but the data that they looked at, you know, you know, has merit, right? 1% of all crashes. So I like the 20% number better for our argument's sake, but, uh, but the 1% is fine. Um, the other, um, but, you know, we know from this project and others that we struggle with the data. The data is not good, right? So they, you know, they, they you know, there, there's more, 
um, I'm not convinced by the by this research project that it, we we have solid results. For example, I think there are more injuries than um, is actually reported. Uh, I don't think it's reported properly. I don't think a lot of and someone made that comment in the chat pod, right? That the that the the data, um, you know, is the data good? Uh, is is you know we we know uh, and we're on a constant mission to try to get that data cleaned up. We actually have a project to try to get the, the crash report, uh, the offices to complete the crash report. Uh, you know, they might not have checked off the sec the bar because this is a secondary crash. They might not have checked it off. So when we, you know, we we just want to emphasize that. So why I'm saying that to the folks here, if you ever have influence on that data, um, please try to, um, you know, A, get it added to the crash report if, if the state's not correct collecting it or our other methods right there's a tmcs and things like that and and if it is work towards getting the data correct you know entered correctly work with the law enforcement officers actually what we're talking about a lot of people have their own definition in their mind when it's secondary crashes and sometimes it's not even related to what to what we're looking for so um with that jim i think that's um you know, we can let them take the questions. I probably have some answers to those questions too, but uh, we can have Kelly and, and Grady uh, ask. Yeah, that. Paul, and, and all good points. Uh, I think the one we already answer for, answered uh, for, from Cynthia Burks, the one you just mentioned, Paul, yeah. about the accuracy of the secondary crash data, and Grady mentioned it as part of the, the recommendations on the last slide. Uh, so that's very important, and Paul just reiterated. Jeff Hotchmuth, I apologize for if I mispronounce your name. Uh, considering so many of the secondary crashes are on interstates, but most crashes are not, do you have a percent of secondary crashes for just interstate crashes? So um, we, we didn't calculate that specifically, but we could with the data that we have. We could. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. Another one from Cynthia Birch. How does a responder know, responder know that a crash is secondary if it's back in the queue? Does dispatch make that identification? So, yeah, Jim, that, I'll, I'll take this one, Jim, if that's all right. Go great. for it. Go for it. You can try. So, um, the, you know, the, our, in our way of thinking, that not the officer at the primary scene is is entering it. It's whoever responds to the to the additional crash or the secondary crash. You're right. The the responder at the initial scene doesn't know what's going on behind them, so it would have to be somebody else, him or her, somebody else. So, um, and the dispatch can help with that as well. But usually, if you respond to that secondary crash and traffic, you're aware of an incident going on in front. Is that sort of what you were going to say, Grady? Absolutely. Yeah. When you're typically when you're working, you kind of know what's going on in your zone and what you know what other things are are present. So, yeah, yeah. And so, Jim, can, I, can I add one more thing to the? Please, so, of course, Paul. <laughs> so Cynthia also said, do states use different de definitions, such as how far into a queue qualify one to two miles? We are not. We do not recommend. Um, we we have. Standard definitions, we have them at the federal highway, we have them, we could share it with you. Um, if you'd add a TMC, the, 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 if you're uh, asking um, relative to a crash report, there was definition within the the, um, the, mock, the minimum model uniform crash criteria, basically what the crash report, the Bible, the crash reports are based on. We do not recommend, or I don't recommend worrying about um, how far a distance it is from the crash, whether it's one mile or two miles. If in the best judgment of the responder or whoever's collecting the data um, believes that that crash is due to a prior crash, then we recommend it be indicated as a, as a secondary. So with that, sorry, Jim. No, no sorries there. You answered two. You answered Cynthia's and Mike, uh, Mike's question as well. If I may, I want to. Yeah, Joe. Sorry, I, there's one that popped up in the uh, 
in the chat pod question. And uh, okay. I'll just read it out. I guess uh, towards Grady, I reckon. Uh, what national guidance are you referencing for your data? Yeah, as Paul mentioned, there's this uh, publication called the Model Minimum Uniform Crash Criteria. It's a mouthful, but if you put in MMUCC um, in any search engine, it'll pop that document up. And right now, the 2017 version, as Kelly mentioned, is the fifth edition, and it's the current one. But it's an, an being revised right now to hopefully include uh, more TIM data elements and clarification on some of those. Yeah, and if you're not talking about the crash report, we have our own um, information. We have our own definition that was created based. The MUC was actually created based on a definition that that we had um, established. When I say we, it's not me. It's not me and Jim. It's not me, Jim and Joe. It was extensive uh, debates with the International Association of Police Chiefs, uh, Tim subcommittee meeting. Uh, it, 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 the definition originally started with um, uh, uh, the, uh, the Focus State Initiative, Ke Kelly mentioned, which was 11 states, police and DOT got together to define the first one, and then we've modified it since. Um, so it's it's you know it's it's what we're comfortable with and you can you can define it a million ways if you really wanted to if you you can worry about the definition and not collect anything but we we always uh, struggle with that so um yeah that's you know the definitions are pretty close to what we recommend and what the mark the mark is based on what we we were using yeah hey jim can i add something about the accuracy yeah so we I think that there is, for, for me, and in really digging into this data, and that there is a question about the accuracy um, and the definitions, and we don't necessarily know the definitions that are being used and, and how the data are being collected state to state. We know what the, the national definition is, um, but how it's actually being applied um, throughout the states, we don't always know. But we had 50, almost 52,000 crashes that were marked as secondary. And that spatial temporal analysis, which for sure is not going to be 100% accurate, um, only came up with about 14,500 of those 52 that we could match with a primary crash. That doesn't mean that there wasn't a primary crash that we couldn't find in the crash data based on the criteria that we set. And it doesn't mean that that wasn't a secondary crash that was secondary to a non-crash primary incident, debris in the road or, or some other, some other non-crash incident that led to a secondary crash. So that is also, you know, could be part of the definition. But I think that there's, that's a big gap. It's about 35,000 crashes that we couldn't find a primary crash for in the data based on the methodology that we applied. Um, and even with a little bit of of error, you know, that's still a lot of crashes that that we couldn't find that primary crash for. So I, I do think that that raises a question about the accuracy of the data that's being collected. Um, but I don't know that we have an answer to what's actually happening based on based on this study because we kind of set those crashes aside and we moved forward to analyze the data that we felt that you know we had a primary crash and we focused on analyzing those data. But I do think that there is a question remaining about those other crashes that were that were marked as secondary by the responders um, and how accurate those are. And, and you know, maybe that's the next step at looking at some of those and understanding those better. But but I do think it raises questions as to the accuracy of the, the data being collected. Kelly, you're spot on as usual. And I think it's fair to say the accuracy, the completeness uh, of data, you know, and being captured uh, in in crash reports and all these areas. I mean, it's it's a it's an ongoing problem, but we we don't give up in in your expertise and dedication to this uh, secondary crash research and and Grady's as well is is hugely appreciated and. We'll keep uh, we'll keep moving forward, right, and doing the best we can, and hopefully more states uh, get involved in uh, working with us and doing the hey, right Jim. thing. So, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to. Um, sorry, I thought you were done there. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm, I'm far from done. I have a very important thing that I need to say okay. before we. Close. I just want to go ahead. I just want to mention that to Cynthia, if 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 
if it would be helpful for to get us on a call, you, you say you, you're trying to improve the the data in Maryland. Um, you know, we actually know the some folks in Maryland is too, but we're more than happy to get on a call and hash it out with you, help in any way we can. So uh, just let us know. And uh, your your message there in the chat uh, is very disturbing about that. Yes, Paul, that's what I want to talk about. So if yeah. if you can let me. Yep. Yeah, um, but before we go, I, I, we still have five minutes. So I, my my point about this horrendous crash today in Maryland, I'll make in in, in one minute here. Uh, but Sam, uh, were you able to answer these other questions regarding the highlight system? How, for example, how easy or difficult is it to program the sequential uh, cones, the, the sequential light on the cones, or well, not cones. I guess it's the pilot itself, the device, right? You still there, there Sam? Now I'm talking. If you could do, answer in 10 seconds or less on each one of these, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's very easy. One, two, it's a click of one or two buttons on the top of the player. Extremely easy. Excellent. What's the approximate cost, Sam, of the lights? Um, our, district, our district paid roughly over 500, but the sets are subject to change based uh, price-wise based off, you know, economy, quality, or quantity, and the type you get. Yeah, and obviously, as you mentioned, they're very durable. Yes. Very durable. Yeah, they offer a great uh, warranty on that too. Yeah. And how many vendors are currently uh, for the system using the system, I guess, in Florida? Um, in Florida. So for the current vendor that does the flares mixed with the host alert for the public mapping system, we're only aware of one, but there are hundreds of uh, LED uh, flare makers. So currently just one that's Pilot with both of the integration um, that I talked about. Very good. Thank you, Sam. Yes, sir. Any... Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, we have three minutes left. Any other pressing questions from anyone else? So uh, before I sign off, I want to sign off with a prayer. But first, I want to thank all our presenters, uh, Sam, uh, Eric, from Texas, Sam, uh, Kelly, and Grady. Uh, but as my colleague Paul, well, Paul, Joe, and and of course Cynthia noted in the chat pod, I I, I want to cry because six people have lost their lives today on the inner loop of the Maryland Beltway just outside of Bal Baltimore near Woodlawn. I don't know if anyone knows. I guess it doesn't matter. But a motorist lost control and overturned. On, on the left shoulder from what I can see on the on the video, the helicopter video, and ran into a, a work zone behind the wall, it looks like, and three, three workers have lost their lives. And uh, Joe shared that at least one other uh, or maybe two were transported with possible uh, heart cardiac issues. And uh, I just want to say, this is horrendous, folks. I, this is really horrible. These aren't responders, but they're still our brothers and sisters. And these are roadside workers that we all we all know about. And uh, I just want to go out by staying silent for the rest of this call. And on behalf of USDOT Federal Highway, Joe, Paul, and myself, Thank you for everything you're doing and keep doing it. So with that, let's pray. <laughs>